In Mark chapter 7, <clears throat> verses 9 and following, uh, right before this, Jesus' disciples were criticized for not washing their hands, and this is part of Jesus' response to the Pharisees. Then he said, you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your own tradition. For instance, Moses gave you this law from God, honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say it is all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you, for I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way, you let them disregard their needy parents. And so you cancel the word of God in order to hand down your own tradition. And this is only one example among many others. Then Jesus called the crowd to come and hear. All of you listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. Amen? Amen. The wonderful thing is we are about to express from our hearts to God our love and devotion for, to him. Isn't that a good thing? Amen. So let's do that together now. Amen. 
And I'm glad we got to start with this little part of the earth right now. May it spread throughout the land.
knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. I have a father, he calls me his own, he'll never leave me, no matter where I go. And he hears me when I call He knows my name He knows my every thought He sees each tear that falls And he hears me when I call, and he hears me when I call, and he hears me when I call. I have a get the feeling that we're kind of calling out to the Lord today, we're reaching out to Him, and it kind of feels like He's reaching back to us too, you know, because that's the important part. <laughs> Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. And do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. All creation groaning, it is. Is a new creation coming, it is. And is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst, it is. And is it good that we remind ourselves of this? anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He is. Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He 
does. And as Jesus our Messiah holds, forever those he loves, he does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe. Every nation and tongue, He has made us a kingdom and priests to God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Forgive us, Lord, where we have placed other names and other things above you and before you. We ask you to speak to us this morning through the word that Pastor Ken will be bringing. We ask you to speak to our hearts privately and in our community as we can share with each other, whether it's by phone, text, email, um, Skype, Zoom, whatever. But may we be encouraged to do the good works that you left for us to do here on this earth. In your mighty name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I've titled this uh, six-week journey through the book of Hosea, A Scandalous Grace. Scandalous uh, that God would love uh, vermin like us, uh, people like us, yeah. <laughs> While we may do terrible things, it's amazing that God has uh, loved us beyond compare. And while we have turned from him, the scandal about grace is that God would even give it to us. The scandal of grace with the nation of Israel was that God would even let them return to him and that he would go through every means necessary to bring them back. It runs so countercultural to the world that we face right now in that normally, uh, often, uh, at least according to the world's standard, certainly not God's standard, the minute somebody does something to you, uh, that's it. They're done. They're toast. It's over. We're gone. We don't want to have anything to do with, with those to do anymore. And what's, what's rather remarkable, especially in the world today, is that nobody's fighting to redeem anybody. We're fighting to basically pump up ourselves. Every post, every article, every newscast seems to be uh, demoralizing, demeaning, and uh, bad-mouthing pretty much anyone that's there. And uh, doesn't really care that they're tearing people apart. In fact, they delight in it. But the amazing thing is that God is holy and that while our sin does demand that uh, we be punished, God, uh, and God makes that clear, especially in the book of Hosea, that... Um, At the same time, he holds himself to his standard and holds us to the standard that he designed us to live by. He has poured himself out in the blood uh, and life and body and death of Jesus Christ and has brought brought us back to himself if we will simply say yes. 
So that's kind of a brief summary of scandalous grace. Don't you, aren't you glad that God is not afraid to be scandalous in the positive sense? So he looked at Hosea 1 and discovered that there's no limit to the love of God, nor how far God will go to bring you to him. We've learned in Hosea 2 that God ruthlessly pursues us through thick and thicker so that we will be his lovers and he can be our love. We saw in Hosea chapter 3 that the Lord has bought us because he earnestly desires to live with us and be intimate with us. We saw in Hosea 4 that God knows what is going on in the nations of the world and is at work to bring them back to a right relationship with him. We saw last week in Hosea chapter 6 that it's a scandal to take back broken, unfaithful, shameful people and then heal, restore, and give them abundant life. But that's exactly what God is doing for those who say yes to him. An amazing, amazing truth. And then finally today, Hosea 14, if we turn ourselves, if we turn from ourselves, please forgive me, and confess that God is right, not we, we receive his grace and live our best life. We live our best life if we turn from ourselves and turn to God, acknowledge him, receive his grace, uh, which is a really wonderful, abundant truth uh, in Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. So that's where we are today. Um, We're going to read this text in its entirety, and then I'll make a few comments, a few introductory comments, uh, and then uh, move into the main body of the text. Listen as we uh, read uh, the Word of God. Hosea chapter one, verse chapter fourteen, verse one. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, "Forgive all our sins, and receive us graciously, that we may offer the fruit of our lips." Assyria cannot save us. We will not mount war horses. We will never again say our gods to what our own hands have made. For in you, the fatherless find compassion. I will heal their waywardness and love them freely. For my anger is turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will again blossom like a lily, like a cedar of Lebanon. He will send down his roots. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree, his fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. Men will dwell again in his shade. He will flourish like the grain. He will blossom like a vine, and his fame will be like the wine from Lebanon. O Ephraim, what more have I to do with, with... O Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? I will answer him and care for him. I am like a green pine tree. Your fruitfulness comes from me. Who is wise? He will realize these things. Who is discerning? He will understand them. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them. But the rebellious stumble in them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So I want to just introduce you to this text uh, through a preamble that's in verse 1, 2, and 3. And it comes to uh, three words, which are return, confess, and receive. It begins in verse 1 by saying, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. There's an action that's supposed to take place, a response that's supposed to be take place, based on the first 13 chapters of... uh, Hosea, although this return uh, is spoken of throughout the entire text. Then it says, confess, take words with you and say, take words with you and say to the Lord. Or to say something to the Lord and take words with us uh, to confess certain things. And we're going to talk about that today. We've got five things that this text encourages us to confess to God, to confess to us. And... uh, than it is to receive. So return, confess, receive. Forgive all our sins and receive us graciously. If you don't think the gospel is in the Old Testament, then you haven't read the Old Testament and really studied the Old Testament and seen that God is is extremely gracious in the Old Testament. And 
The opposite is true. If you've not read the New Testament and seen the judgment of God, the required righteousness of God, you've not, you've not read the New Testament. And you've probably glossed over it and not faced it uh, squarely, and squarely uh, in the face. But there is a fourth word here at the beginning, and that is offer, and I think this is particularly fascinating. In verse 2 it says that we may offer the fruit of our lips. So we are to return and confess and receive, and then as a result of all that, why would you not <laughs> offer praise to God, the fruit of your lips? And isn't it fascinating that basically all God wants is the fruit of your lips, the praise of your lips, for him to get the glory and the honor? Uh, God said, I just want to live with you in the garden. I just want to live with you on earth. I want to live with you here in Quartz Hill or wherever you find yourself. And I'd just like to have a relationship with you. And I'd like you to know that I love you. And I'd like for you to receive that. And uh, <laughs> wouldn't it just be great for you to praise me and honor me and glorify me? And uh, everything else will be taken care of. But uh, we won't spend any more time on that because we need to move on. And we're spending the most of our time today in confession. Actually, some of these confessions are, God, are, are things that God confesses, but uh, I think we'll see that all through as we go through this. Uh, I came across a song uh, by Doris Day from the 1950s, something like that, that said, I'm confessing that I love you. <laughs> I think, I, think I, I listened to it, and after the first couple of lyrics, um, I didn't enjoy it much, but then I'm not from that generation. But at that particular time, Doris Day was quite the hit. And somewhere in the back of my memory, I, I'm, I'm researching and I'm thinking and I'm ruminating on this whole, you know, I'm confessing, Lord. And then, and then somehow it came to my mind, mm, I'm confessing that I love you. So I had to type in confessing that I love you and found Doris Day and all that sort of stuff. And why did I tell you that? I don't know. <sighs> but this is what happens when you start ruminating on a text. And, uh, you know, it's a perfect example, though, of what God wants for us. That we're confessing that we love you, Lord. Uh, my mind is going in so many different directions today. I could, so, I could say so many different things, but you know there is a time limit, and I'll be hungry at some point in time. And we will too. And yeah, you probably will. You know, there's donuts. There's still donuts out here. <laughs> oh my goodness! So confession number one is we can't save ourselves. Do you know how scandalous that confession is? The title of this message is A Scandalous Confession. Do you know how scandalous, is it, scandalous it is in America in the 21st century in 2020 to say we can't save ourselves? Absolutely. But every single politician is telling us that they can save us. Oh. I'm thinking of a word that I'm not going to say right now. Two words. <laughs> well, it can be put into one. <laughs> I've told you before that every once in a while when I'm looking at the media, I'm looking at television, and I'm looking at whatever it is, you know, it's t entirely appropriate to say, uh, liar, liar. So verse 3 says, our, uh, uh, let me read it in this context. It says, uh, Assyria cannot save us. Assyria was where they were going to. Assyria wasn't going to save them. We will not, we will not, we will not, we will not mount war horses, of course. Israel at that time had not much of an army. And we will never again say our gods to what our own hands have made. And we've made a lot of stuff to be our own god. Our wealth, our status, our jobs, our location. Have you ever thought about the place where you live might say something about who you are and what you want? And I'm thinking of whole sorts of stuff on that, but I can't go there, <laughs> including me. The text goes on to say, uh, which is rather remarkable, at the end of verse 3, it says, In you the fatherless find compassion. What in the world is that all about in this context? Why would the writer Hosea of his book say at the end of that, Nothing will save us, but in you the fatherless find compassion is because those people who know they are helpless. Those people who have no other resource to rely on. And, and how bad can it be if you're fatherless or motherless or parentless, at least as a child, does that make you? Well, a fatherless, a motherless, a parentless child can say, um, will somebody please have compassion on me? 
And that's where we need to be. We need to be in a position where we say, well, somebody have compassion on me because the world has no compassion on us. And thank God that this week I saw the compassion of God in the face of God's people. You know, holy cow. The only reason we're in an air-conditioned building right now and people can come back to an air-conditioning building whenever God allows that is because the body of Christ was at work. And uh, nobody was looking for the glory. We were just saying, hey, how can we worship the Lord in comfort instead of 90-degree weather, right? But if we're trusting in the AC to have a nice time of worship, well, then that's an idol too. And so we should disavow ourselves of that, although I'm sure God doesn't mind us being fairly comfortable. Uh, Psalm 68 says, A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy place. God sets the lonely in families. He leads forth the prisoners with singing. If you haven't come to the conclusion that you and yourself can't pull this act called the human life off, <sighs> you will. <laughs> you will, eventually. Hopefully not at your time of death. Hopefully sooner than that. Cheryl Chumley is a woman I ran into this last week. She's a Christian, a writer, an author, a speaker. She's the online opinion editor uh, at the Washington Times, which I find fascinating. She says this, America can't be moral without God. Wow. One of our political candidates said that he was more moral than the other and said that he would bring morality back to the White House. <laughs> nope. Cheryl says this, uh, America can't be moral without God. She has two points. One is Americans must believe in God, and two, Americans must recognize God as the leader by obeying his will. Did you know that our, uh, our foundation, our, our founding fathers, even in their documents mentioned that this democracy would not work if people abandoned God, it did not get their morality from God. And that's exactly what's happening. Uh, she says this, uh, the Pew Research Center's latest global God divide finds that only 44% of Americans think they need the heavenly creator to shape their morals and values. Wrong. Less than half think that... Uh, we need God. Uh, she goes on to write, this country is in a free fall of cultural, I don't like this word, rot, <laughs> and moral decay. And how the culture goes, so too the politics. That's what morals that bend and bow to humans will bring. And she says this, Look to abortion rates, single parent and fatherless home rates, drug and alcohol addiction rates, youth incarceration and gang membership rates, divorce rates, domestic and child abuse rates, and more. Then, uh, this, is getting, this is getting pretty touchy, then look to the utter chaos that be, that, that's become Congress. The absolute stonewalling that puts, quote, uh, that puts all policies truly for the people on pause. Look to the fact that there are socialists, open socialists, serving in public service, pretending to serve out their oaths to the Constitution with honor. It's hardly coincidental that all this cultural spiraling and political turmoil comes as more and more Americans, as the Pew Research poll says, poo-pooing the Bible, church, godly teachings, and the idea of a God who actively governs in the thoughts and deeds of believers. And here's where it gets rather uh, telling. She says, because abortion, after all, isn't murder. It's saving a woman's life. Because promiscuity, after all, isn't damage. It's damaging to traditional family structure. It's freeing. And I think I have one more slide here left. Morals can mean anything when there's no higher authority to dictate and define. Amen. Yeah. There you go. Confession number two. I will heal their waywardness and love them freely. So our confession number two would be only God can save us. First, we can't save ourselves. Who can save us? Only God can save us. And God says, uh, and here's where the point that I mentioned earlier about God confessing certain things. God confesses, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely. And we need to confess that as well. 
Uh, here's a very pleasant illustration of how God can save us. And he says, this I will be like the dew to Israel. Now, we have virtually no dew here in the Antelope Valley. I'm amazed when I go back and I stay at my parents' house in Santa Barbara and I wake up in the morning. It's just wet as if it's rained. It hasn't rained, it's just dew. And uh, it's amazing how God provides uh, for his earth and for his creatures and uh, how beautiful it is. Uh, to see the dew out, and that's what God says he will do for us. Isaiah 43 says, You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so, so that you may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. And to those who think that every other religion is just a different way to get to the same place, I'm here to tell you that's a lie. It's from the pit of hell, and it smells like smoke. And if you're trusting in anyone other than Jesus Christ, uh, you are going down the wrong way. Why would Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? No one comes to the Father but by me. You either need to believe Christ and Christianity, hook, line, and sinker, or give it up, because you're living a lie. Isn't it interesting that God says here in Isaiah 43, and this is, this is littered all over, the, all over the Bible, that it would no one believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, and nor will there be one after me. Here's a story I'd like to give to you today, and that is a uh, Muslim in Nigeria moved by Christian's kindness turns to Christ. A staunch Muslim in a 90% Muslim area of Nigeria named Idris, and that asterisk, if you can see it, means that that's not his real name, was so opposed to the well that these Christians were digging for the benefit of uh, this part of Nigeria and other services local missionary provided that he ordered his wife not to drink the new well water. And here's where I need to go off, off to my article here. <laughs> I have just a few highlights up there. According to the Christian Aid Mission, Idris has opposed the efforts of Christian workers for many years. A local leader said Idris believed he had a mandate to stop all efforts to lure people away from Allah and his prophet. And he told local, local missionaries to leave the area. Recently, his pre-teen son was hit with rashes, vomiting, pain in his eyes, joints, and bones. His father, Idris, rushed him to a medical clinic. But in that area of Nigeria, hospitals do not admit patients who cannot pay ahead of time for their services. At that time, he had no Nigerian, uh, uh, their local word for money, to his name, uh, this ministry leader said, uh, quote, no one was willing to loan him the money. Our missionary heard the news that Idris was stranded and that his son was dying, and our workers went straight to the hospital and gave him the equivalent of about 40 bucks, $40. This amount was enough for the doctors to treat him for a few days, keeping the boy alive until the illness ran its course. His son returned home and recovered after several days' rest. The genuine concern for him and his son's welfare from Christians he had hurt changed Idris's attitude. They would have no illusions about him leaving Islam, Idris, uh, Idris thought, yet they had gladly helped an enemy. Uh, as, and here's the next quote. As grateful as he was astonished, Idris began to research Christianity. He had to try to find out what was behind such bizarre behavior. He accepted, he has accepted Christ, uh, uh, whom he so hated, and his whole family accepted Christ. Now he is so committed, he wants to go to school as a missionary to his people. There you go. He realized there were Christians who loved him, and that that was the only God who could save him. So, confession number one is uh, we can't save ourselves. Confession number two, only God can save us. Confession number three, uh, and this seemed a little out of place for me at first, but then it made perfect sense, and that is we will rise again. 
Now, the phrase doesn't use uh, rise, but clearly the New Testament illuminates the fact that we will rise again. And certainly the picture of a lily, at least in my mind, although I don't think this is scriptural, reminds me of Easter because we put lilies out, right? But here we have, uh, he will blossom like a lily. And I guess if a lily is going to blossom, it has to rise out of the ground, right? And I appreciated this after I thought about it for a long time, that we need to confess to ourselves that we will rise again. And, of course, the way we rise again is that God brings us up, and that's, that is only by God's power. And I guess as the phrase goes, you can't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, and certainly that's a, a major mantra of the American experience, that you can raise yourself up by your own bootstraps. But, uh, you know, and, 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 of course, there's some worldly truth to that. But in the heavenly realm, you're not going to be able to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And, by the way, I didn't refer to it quite a number of weeks ago. Most people who profess Christianity believe, a majority in churches believe that the good works they're doing will gain God's favor and bring them into heaven. A majority of them who say they're Christians and frequent the church. And just speaking personally, that's what I've encountered. In the church, your average Christian thinks that they just need to be good and that somehow that will outweigh the bad they do and that that will get them to heaven. And that's from the pit of hell. And it's already on fire and is rotten and decaying. One of the saddest things I ever hear is that people think that their good works will outbalance their bad works. And have you read lately... Romans chapter 3 that says, there's none of you who do good. There's none of you who seek after God. All of your good works are filthy rags. There's not one of you good. And then to convince you otherwise, which I've been trying for 40 years of ministry to do, it says, no, not even you. So if the shoe fits, if the word fits, listen to it, my friends, please. I beg of you. And here's a, a, a combination of the indication we will rise again, and I realize that's a terrible color against that background, but it's too late. <laughs> it, it occurred to me when I was making this that there are some people who are colorblind. My dad, he, that, you know, that would mean nothing to him. He can't distinguish between the greens and the reds and the oranges. Anyway. Uh, you will grow, dwell, flourish, and blossom like the roots, shoots, splendor, fragrance, shade of the cedars, and vine, grain, and fame of Lebanon. And I have a whole bunch of stuff to tell you how great Lebanon was and how much they relied on Lebanon in those days, but we don't have time. But isn't that amazing? Grow, dwell, flourish, blossom, shoots, splendor, fragrance, shade of the cedars, and vine, grain, and fame of Lebanon. That's a confession that God loves us, <laughs> okay, to turn a phrase. And then God says in Isaiah 14, The Lord will have compassion on Jacob. Once again, he will choose Israel and will settle them in their own land. Now, here's a, another story from Lebanon, a different story from Lebanon that I'd like to share with you, and that is this. A Lebanese priest says it's a miracle the church survived a blast, and I'm not talking about a Holy Spirit blast. <laughs> I'm talking about a blast from the explosion that killed thousands of people and, and uh, made homeless hundreds of thousands of people just a few weeks ago in Beirut, Lebanon. Here is a short video that apparently one of their security cameras, I'm thinking, caught of the actual explosion as this priest was uh, conducting worship. Let's take a look. <laughs> Father Muad from St. Marin 
Bacharik Church in Beirut, Lebanon says, we felt the grace of God who was with us. Because when you look down at the damage, you can think that no one can come out of this alive because they were big damages with lots of glass and iron pieces that exploded. It's truly a miracle. It's a miracle. He goes on to say, uh, despite all the carnage in Beirut, church goers returned for worship on Sunday. This was on a Tuesday. They returned to wor worship on Sunday. Uh, the faith in Jesus Christ gives us the courage to come back to church. Of course, what we are going through is a catastrophe. We are praying for all the dead people, for all the injured, for all the children. We hope to survive. But here in Lebanon, we already are survivors. Isn't that a great quote? But they give credit to Jesus Christ, and they want to continue to survive, and they are survivors. And we're going to be survivors here <laughs> at this place, at this time in history. All right, confession four, this is the second to last one, is our fruitfulness comes from God. Once again, uh, it's, and that's just a direct quote of verse eight that says, your, fruitful, your fruitfulness comes from me. But God considers it really important for us to acknowledge the fact that our fruitfulness comes from God. And I run into so many churches who think that it's entirely their responsibility to be fruitful for God. And God says uh, here in John 15, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And did you notice in that, uh, in that one uh, verse how many times one particular word appears? And what is that word? Remain. Remain in me. It must remain in the vine, which is another way of saying me. Uh, remain in me. So how do you produce good fruit? You remain in the Lord. You keep, stay connected to the Lord. And uh, without getting specific, although many of you will know my particular bias, <laughs> uh, there's some Christians and some churches and some denominations who are not remaining in the Lord, and the work that they do, Scripture says, is in vain. In Matthew chapter 7, some of those people will go to the Lord on the last day and say, but we did this in your name, and we did that in your name. And Jesus will say, huh? Who are you? I have no idea who you are. You didn't do it in my name. Were they good works? Yes. Did they accomplish my purposes? Well, I used them, but they were done in vain. Uh, and then he says, uh, uh, leave me. You have nothing to do with me. Uh, verse 8 goes on to say, I will answer and care for Israel, for I am like a green pine tree. Why a green pine tree? Not really sure, but I like pine trees, and I like it when they're green. <laughs> so you, you, you exegete that and tell me uh, in a text later today. All right. Uh, knowing how trustworthy God's word is, uh, is seen in this Bible cross-reference graphic. This, uh, according to what it, how it was posted, said this might be the most amazing data picture you see in a lifetime. It shows, six, it shows the 63,779 cross-references in the Bible. So there, there, there are 63,779 cross-references in the Bible where, where uh, something in the Old Testament refers to the New, something in the New returns to the Old, and I'm, I'm guessing that something in the Old refers to the Old and New to New, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. The white bars, if you can see them, and I'll, I'll uh, post this to uh, Facebook uh, today in, in the next 24 hours. Uh, the white bars along the bottom represent each Bible chapter, Genesis 1 through Revelation 22. The entire Bible, each one of those white ticks refers to every chapter in the Bible. The lines color shows the references distance from the other. A cross-reference, by the way, is a scripture that references another scripture. And then this point is made. Had the Bible been written by one person at, or at one time, this would still be amazing. However, the Bible was written by 40 authors over the span of 1,500 years on three different continents, which goes to show that, shows that while the Bible is complex, diverse, and intricate, it has one unified message. God lovingly is redeeming all who believe. Folks, that's not possible without a God who oversees the whole process. There is no other, there is no other uh, document that uh, is purported to be a, a uh, 
a religious piece of literature that holds up to that kind of scrutiny. But people are falling for it left and right. I could use examples, but we're running out of time. Uh, and then the fifth and final confession is the Lord was right. Now, this is kind of a repeat of some of those things, but, but uh, <laughs> it says in verse 9, the ways of the Lord are right, and we will walk in them. Uh, this week, uh, my wife told me that I had told her something, and I said, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> and she was pretty sure that I said it. And, you know, no man wants to ask for directions. And most men and many other people don't like to admit they were wrong. But thank God he's working on my life. And I said, well, you know, it's possible that I might have said that. <laughs> and you know how hard that is for your average person to say? Uh, to say that you might have been wrong? And, and, then, and I said, well, you know, I, I, this particular time in my week, I might not have entirely been a sound mind and body. So I'll give it to you that I, you know, yeah, I could have said that. I didn't say that I did say it, but I did admit that I could have said it and that I may have. So, uh, Thus you come to us this morning alive. <laughs> right, yeah, and married. And married. <laughs> and still married. Uh, maybe I share that so that uh, some of the men who are listening will get a clue and not try to be stick in the muds and always write. Uh, You're ruining my entire personality. Yeah, yeah, and that might that might be the toughest thing you hear today. That you need to, you, you should admit. You know, one of the reasons I think that my children came to the Lord is because there were regular times when I said, you know, I was wrong. I was wrong, and I think that's a wonderful thing for children, and our spouses, and our neighbors. You know, when it, when when it's true, or when we aren't sure, you say, hey, you know, I might be wrong. But that's so rare today. Have you, have you heard a politician say lately that they might have been wrong? Uh, no. During the election year. No, no. Terrible. And so uh, it, says, it says in uh, this verse, uh, verse 9, who is wise? Well, if you're wise, you're going to realize these things. What are you realizing? The Lord was right. Uh, who is discerning? If you're discerning, you will understand them. And what is it you understand? The Lord was right. The Lord was right. Thank God the Lord was right. We should praise God that he was right. At least somebody's right. <laughs> uh, Isaiah 43, this time verse 11, the previous one was verse 10. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I and not some foreign god among you. Who are the foreign gods in our midst here in America at least? Uh, money, our status, our jobs, our purity, our own self-made righteousness, where we live, who we're going to vote for. <laughs> uh, oh boy. Here's my last illustration. Again, uh, from... Beirut, Lebanon. A Holy Spirit hunch, this article is titled, Led Lebanese Pastor to Send Everyone Home Before the Explosion. This is uh, by Pastor Saeed Deeb of the Life Center Church in Beirut. Uh, he said the day the massive explosion, a strange feeling came over him, a combination of anxiety, anger, and sadness that shook him to the core. He said he prayed with his staff but didn't get a breakthrough and couldn't shake the feeling that something bad was going to happen. Turning now to Lebanon, another hotspot in the Middle East where one Beirut pastor, while wow, he is thanking God for a Holy Spirit hunch that he says saved the lives of his church members from that massive explosion in Beirut. Pastor Saeed Daib said he felt the need to send everyone home early that day. He was so concerned over the risk of COVID-19, but little did he know the reality 
was far worse. 34 church members and 240 children gathered each day at his Life Center Church in Beirut, which is just a two-minute drive from the site of the explosion. He says the blast blew the windows from one wall to another and took everything out in between, and no one would have survived. And Pastor Saeed joins us now by Skype. Pastor, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for hosting me, Wendy. Pastor, you say the day of that horrific explosion at the port in Beirut that you heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. What did he say to you? Yeah, we were meeting and praying at about 1 p.m. Uh, we pray every morning because at night we have discipleship groups and we have uh, kids that comes uh, because we have a center that hosts all the refugee kids, Syrian refugees. And we have lots of refugees come for discipleship. We have uh, meetings in every room. We have so many classrooms. And we are 34 staff there. So I, I, was, I, I was feeling anxious. I don't know what happened to my heart. And I was feeling uh, not, not at ease. And I don't know what to explain it. I felt something is going to happen. Uh, something bad is going to happen. We start praying, praying, but we didn't get the breakthrough. So I don't know why I was so rude. I went, everybody go home, go home, close everything and go home. Just close the center. I said, how, how come we have a commitment to have meetings? We came long, long ways, long distances and now saying, go home. I said, I don't know why, but please go home and come on Sunday. It was a Tuesday afternoon. Wow, thank and, goodness. Uh, what went through your mind when when you felt the Lord tell everyone to go home, what were you thinking? Well, I, I, I don't know what happened with me. It's like anger, uh, sadness. I don't know what is this, but something so, so uh, intense, just like as if the Holy Spirit say, go, 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 go. So I was saying, everybody, go, go, go home, go home, go home, pushing them, turn off the computers, forcing them to leave. I was forcing them. And they said, we are cooking. We need to, to distribute food for refugees and for the poor. I said, today, cancel everything, put it in the fridge. So they, they were thinking, I lost my mind. But they didn't know, and I didn't know, this is the Holy Spirit prompting. I didn't know why. That's why I said, I don't know why, just leave. Quite the story. 34 people, adults, and 200 and some odd children to go home. They were thinking, <laughs> I love this phrase, right? they were thinking I lost my mind. But they didn't know, and I didn't know, it was the Holy Spirit's prompting. Wow. You know, the Word of God we looked at today uh, is, using the, the Holy Spirit, uh, is used by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit uses it to speak to us to talk with us, to tell us about his love, to tell us to turn from ourselves, to turn us, to tell us uh, to confess that God is right, to tell us that we need to receive his grace and our life will be lived, as Jesus said, to the fullest and abundantly. We currently are in the midst of 50 days of Holy Spirit and uh, there are a group of people who are meeting in person on Monday nights at 6.30 in our prayer room right next to here and we're posting and talking, myself and Chris and Marcia are praying and talking and sharing uh, about uh, the reading we're doing in the book by Billy Graham called The Holy Spirit. And I know there's a number of you who are joining us online at that time. And if you haven't, they're still posted to Facebook and you can find them. Uh, there are still books available if you'd like to join us and read. There's questions uh, that are posted in a new uh, website we have. We, have the old, we, we continue to post to the old website, cosumc.com. But we have one where the blog is posted, ChristOurSaviorUMC.com. And I'm posting a, a blog once a week, and others are posting a few things, and you can go there and read those and, and reflect on them. And, and I'm waiting for the first person to send me uh, a question about the Holy Spirit. So, uh, and, I'll, and I'll read those. I won't tell who you are if, you're, if you don't want, and uh, we'll answer those this coming Monday night at 6.30. And every Monday night through, uh, through the month of September. Ah. <sighs> And it's great to know there is a God that he loves us, that he cares for us, and that he's providing for us. If I didn't know the Lord at this time in history, uh, 
especially at this time in history, but when has there not been a time in history when we've needed the Lord and life's been so, so crazy? I told a friend of mine, I feel like I'm in the twilight zone. <laughs> and I mean, literally, I feel like I'm in the twilight zone. But we're not, because God's not. And we confess that, the God, that God loves us and that he is our God and that we will serve him and he will provide for us every moment of every day as long as we're here. And until Jesus comes again, let's pray. Our Lord and our God, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Lover, our Provider, our Friend, God, we say to you right now that we can't save ourselves. We have tried personally, collectively, as a nation, as a world, and it has failed miserably, Lord God, and most of the world doesn't even realize that. But Lord, today, here, in this place, we, can say, we, we, we will say, we do say that we can't save ourselves and that only you can save us. Lord, without you, we have, n we, we have n no defense mechanism. When you asked your disciples uh, uh, that when you left, if they were going to leave you, and they said, where can we go? There's no life, and we're so grateful, God, that they did not leave and that you will not let us leave. For those who are hanging on, for those uh, who think uh, all is lost and wonder if they can last one more day, would you remind them, Lord God, that they will rise again because Jesus rose again. Will you remind them, Lord God, that the fruitfulness that they have comes from you? And the Lord, we are just simply to remain. And that you will provide us the joy and the peace and the satisfaction to give uh, you the fruit of our lips, which is praise and thanks and glory and honor. And God, uh, may we then confess that your ways are right and that we would walk in them, Lord God, because we, when we don't, we stumble. Lord, may you accomplish in our lives the very purpose of what you have planned for us, and that God may it be your praise and glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name we say, Amen. for who you are and everything you've done Oh, I know what I'm reaching for I know what I'm reaching for I'm reaching for you I'm reaching for you Oh, I know what I'm living for I know what I'm living for I'm living for you Where my hope is coming from I lift my hands for you You are in everything you've done Oh, I know what I'm reaching for I know what I'm reaching for I'm reaching for you I'm reaching for you Oh, I know what I'm living for I'm living for, I'm living for you, I'm living for you.
sun Wherever you are, I can see it You're the light in the dark You are, you are, you are Whoa. There is power When I say your name, I can feel it Cause you're breaking the change You are, you are, you are Whoa. There is freedom Wherever you are, and I can see it Light in the dark, you are, you are, you are, oh, there is power, when I say your name, and I can feel it, cause you're breaking the change, you are, you are, you are, oh, I know what I'm reaching for, I know what I'm reaching for. I'm reaching for you, I'm reaching for you, oh, 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 oh. I know what I'm living for, I know what I'm living for, I'm living for you, I'm living for you, oh, 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 oh. I know what I'm reaching for, I know what I'm reaching for, I'm reaching for you, I'm reaching for you. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, God Almighty, bless you and keep you, love you, support you, surround you, and send you into this world with joy. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen.